Yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Michael Wilberger from the High Altitude Observing or High Altitude Observatory, and he's going to talk to us about space weather. Great. Um, uh, it's my pleasure here. To, oh, no, I, I've got the I've got the portable one. It's my pleasure to uh, um, give a, uh, an ASP uh, seminar here on, on modeling space weather for all of my HAO colleagues sitting in the audience. This is going to be very remedial for you, or at least hopefully it'll be very remedial for you. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is give you a little bit of an overview of, of space weather, what it is, and what we do to model it here in the observatory. It's nice to start a talk off with a couple of pretty pictures for those of you that were in the car networking day. You may have seen pretty pictures already because I stole a few slides from, from that talk to this talk here. This is an image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory satellite, which is a uh, bird sitting in geosynchronous orbit with a bunch of different uh, wavelengths that it can use to image the sun. And so this is a multi-spectral, false color image of the, of the sun. You can see this beautiful solar prominence on the, on the side limb of the sun with the, these features that are aligned along the magnetic fields coming in. And, and there may even be a bit of a flare going off here at this point in time. I'm not sure from the actual image. And the image on the right is actually uh, of Aurora here in Colorado. This uh, white glowy thing that you see on the edge of the front range here is the, actually the Mesa Lab. Uh, this was a picture taken by my colleague Stan Solomon in uh, November of uh, 2003 during a uh, major geomagnetic storm event in which the aurora were visible. You can see this beautiful aurora with the, the green, highly energetic aurora down here at lower um, uh, altitudes and a bit more of the, the less energetic uh, red aurora coming into play. One of the, the major consequences, one of the major things in, in space weather, actually one of the major, major things that people would love to have forecasts of. And, and to do a good space weather forecast, that kind of aurora forecast, what you need is actually the, the merging of two things, right? You need good weather forecasts to say, okay, they're going to be aurora, and then you obviously need good weather forecasts to tell you that it's going to be clear so that you can see the aurora that's happening at that point in time. And uh, Iceland, uh, the Iceland uh, um, uh, Meteorological Office does exactly that. They merge their weather forecasts, information from the space weather community, and the uh, the Icelandic uh, weather forecasts to let you know whether or not you're actually going to be able to see the aurora on any given day. So break this talk up into, into three basic parts. The first part will be a bit of an overview about what is space weather, what is this terminology, what are we talking about when we're, when we're talking about it. I'll also try to give you a little bit about where it comes from and why do we care about it down here on, on the Earth for, for our systems. And then we'll spend the vast majority of our time looking at um, the various ways that we go about modeling um, uh, space weather and, and whatnot. We'll, we'll go into the coupled models for geospace, get into a bit more technical detail about um, material flowing out of the upper, upper levels of the, the atmosphere, the ionosphere, the impacts on that, and then some, some fun high resolution simulations that I've just been doing in the, in the near Earth portion of the, of the system that can impact the dynamics of the magnetosphere. And then I'll try to tell you a little bit about where we want to go with the predicting of, of space weather in the future. So space weather, how does space weather get noticed? What happens when people think about space weather? Generally speaking, usually you get the ah, freak out media alert that happens. And that usually happens as the result of NASA releasing some cool image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory of an event on the sun. And you get this little, you know, this is this beautiful little coronal structure that you're right there, a little flare going on, and then actually we'll see a little burst of, of, a, of a coronal mass ejection coming out from this kind of, a, kind of a structure. Since it's a pretty picture, the media likes pretty pictures, and they jump on top of that, and you get a, um, uh, uh, you know, blurb that shows up in somebody's weather um, uh, web page. This is actually from the, the Washington Post Capital Weather Gang. Uh, I, I stole this slide from, from presentations that I've used to, to brief political staffers because they all pay attention to the Capitol weather game. And so anything that shows up in there gets the attention of Congress. And it may also get the attention of other aspects of the, uh, the news media. And the true freakout begins. And it goes viral. And you get the, the various uh, media representations of things that are going on. You can get you know, live on camera discussion about the big solar storm hitting the Earth. And 
solar flare unleashes, major solar flare unleashed at the Earth, um, uh, solar storms erupting things, hit even maybe even make it into the uh, to the Denver Post, and and occasionally folks from NCAR will get it, uh, interviewed here, or folks over at the Space Weather Prediction Center, which is here in Boulder in the the, the David Skaggs building over on the the NOAA complex over there in in Boulder, but this general gloom and doom, you know, kind of a thing. I forgot to mention with this, with this um, uh, image here, uh, this was from September of last year. And, you know, major geomagnetic storm hitting the Earth. Does anybody remember anything about this major geomagnetic storm hitting the Earth of September of last year? Yeah, because it was pretty much a dud. And one of the questions of why it was a dud and what happened with that dud is one of the things that hopefully you will walk out of your understanding and I'll be able to explain to you with, with, you know, when we go forward through that. But what is this space weather concept? What is, the, what is the process that we're talking about? We generically use the term space weather to describe the events in the nearer space environment that can affect our, uh, our uh, technology. And that has put together a, a beautiful little overview animation here that lets us sort of explain what's going on with things. So we get looking at the sun, kind of the animation kind of view here. We're going to get this bright flare and then a coronal mass ejection, an energized ball of hot plasma leaving the surface of the sun with a magnetic field embedded in it that comes flowing into the near Earth space. We call this the Earth's magnetosphere, where the Earth's magnetic field is providing a bit of a protective bubble. And then the plasma can come into the Earth's magnetosphere, get energized, and flow down along field lines and create the aurora in the, in the system that we're looking at. It all starts with these coronal mass ejections in the, uh, on the sun that eject that um, uh, gas out into the into the uh, um, uh, into the into the near Earth space, or excuse me, into the heliosphere, coming to the near Earth space. The travel time for a coronal mass ejection depends a bit on how fast it's ejected out of there, but it usually takes somewhere on the order of two to four days to make that travel distance. For um, a reference point, you know, always a fun little number to have in the back of your head is that the Earth, or the Earth is about eight light minutes away from the sun. So the light that's leaving the surface of the sun takes eight minutes to get here. So if you were to turn off the sun, you wouldn't know you'd turned off the sun until eight minutes later because the, the light would go out and, and you'd be really worried about it. A lot of the stuff that's happening on those bright energetic particle light emission kind of things happens on that eight minute time scale kind of hard to do anything about an eight minute kind of a time scale. But here's where we get one of our big advantages in space weather and where we can get that from, is the fact that we've got sort of this two to four day propagation time for the stuff that's traveling at a thousand kilometers per second to make it through to the arrive here at that point in time. One of the big things come in there. And then the, the Earth's magnetosphere is that area that we uh, um, uh, like to talk about for the Earth's magnetic field providing a bit of a protective bubble from the flow that's coming from the sun. It's actually supersonic. It's hotter than its local sound speed, so it's creating a shock in the front and, and uh, interacts with the, uh, the magnetic fields from there. It has a variety of um, uh, different impacts on our technological systems here uh, in, the, in the near Earth space. So we get this solar wind blob that's coming in from the from the CME and flying into, in, into the, uh, the near space. It can affect satellite operations in a variety of ways. One is a degradation to the solar radiation panels that are used to generate power from the spacecraft. You're also moving a bunch of charged particles around and moving particles around on, on metal and near dielectric materials that are in the batteries or in the semiconductors can cause single event upsets. Uh, deep dielectric discharge, i.e., a lightning bolt in your in your um, uh, in your dielectric material on your spacecraft. That's generally not good. It makes the spacecraft fail. And since these things usually cost hundreds of millions of dollars to operate, and there's there's roughly um, uh, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, tens of billions of dollars of space. Uh, satellites in the geosynchronous orbit alone that are up there from that from that thing. So there's a real monetary risk for that kind of a aspect of things. The charged particles flowing down into the um, upper level, the atmosphere, the ionosphere that are creating the aurora are energizing the particles up there, creating um, uh, um, uh, the ionosphere itself. Uh, when you send radio waves through the ionosphere, it depends on how much material you have there, you're going to affect the, the propagation uh, uh, of that radio wave, and you're also going to affect uh, which paths it follows. So it's a big deal for, for communications. Uh, the communication thing is actually linked to the GPS network. The GPS network is a 
actually doing triangulation, right? I know where the satellites are supposed to be, and I'm gonna send a signal out to that satellite and get it to come back, or I'm gonna get the signal coming back from that satellite, and I know how long it took for it to go from there, and I can find some other little satellite and do that same triangulation calculation. And so you're just doing a whole timing kind of a calculation to figure out where you are. Well, if the ionosphere isn't what you think it is supposed to be there, it's gonna introduce a small amount of propagation timing error into the calculation. Small amount of propagation timing error can translate into a fairly significant error in the, in the GPS network. For, you know, driving around in your car, probably not that big of a deal. But if you're driving in like me from Denver every day and you're looking at 36, every one of the um, uh, tractors and graders that are out there that are grading that road and where it's gonna go are using precision GPS to tell that blade where it is, how high to have it up, which angle to have it at, so they can get that road exactly where they wanna have it. Farmers are using it for planting seeds and putting water and fertilizer on top of that particular seed crop to reduce the effects for, to improve the efficiency of what they're trying to do. And last but not least is exploration geophysics. You know, you're mining um, uh, uh, in, in, in the ocean and you want to keep your um, uh, drill head over the top of your drill that's going down a mile underwater. Small errors in your positioning can factor into that factor in, into that display as well. On the communication sides, there's also a big impact on aircraft operations. One of the major changes that's happened since the end of the Cold War is the opening of the polar routes for flying, in addition to more efficient aircraft and, and other things along those lines. When you're flying over the North Pole or, or whatever to get from Chicago to Beijing, for example, you want to be in radio communication with the guys back on the ground so that you can say, hey, I had a problem, send some help to me. I mean, it's actually a legal requirement. You can't knowingly fly to uh, an area where you can communicate back on, on the ground. And so if there's a big geomagnetic storm going on, ionosphere gets disturbed, you can't have that communication. It's like, okay, not a big deal, we'll just use satellite communications. Most of the aircraft have um, uh, satellite communications for geosynchronous satellites. Once you get over about 85 degrees, you can't actually see geosynchronous orbit. So you need to go to something else. You can engineer around it if you go to like an Iridium type of satellite phone and they're moving towards that right now. But there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of, of um, uh, costs associated with moving aircraft routes or taking, taking um, uh, cargo off to be able to, to get, go fly a different route aircraft operations. There's also a risk for um, uh, uh, radiation exposure from the energetic particles that are coming in. It's much higher in the polar cap than it is in the, in the lower uh, latitudes on the Earth. In, of note, of interesting note, if you will, is that in the European Union air crew, so pilots, flight attendants, uh, folks that are on the aircraft, actually classified as radiation hazard workers, that they actually have to monitor their dosages and, and whatnot for the, over, their, over their, their, their trips and, and whatnot. The exposure risks are relatively small, even for a polar route, but they can get close to um, uh, the perinatal exposure limits for uh, pregnant females, especially in the early stages of their pregnancy. So there is a real risk, a real concern associated with that, and we're working on um, uh, models to predict that and observations to verify how much actual risk there is in that, on that side of things. And then last but not least on this slide is the power grid operation side of things. What you're seeing here is a rather dramatic fo photo of the failure of a transformer in, in um, of, of, the, of the power grid. You, you want to transmit all of your power at high voltages so you can reduce the amount of loss that you have from the dual heating in your, in your power lines. And to step it up to that level, you need to use a transformer. These transformers can be impacted by the currents that are induced in them from the changing currents that are flowing in the um, uh, magnetosphere, ionosphere system that are essentially causing the aurora. Every time you see that aurora changing, there's a current flowing in that system. Those changing currents can drive the power grids in, or drive the transformers into a nonlinear response phase where they can fail. Um, the there have actually been incidences of this in March of 1989. There's a famous event that all the weather people quote that's the Hydro-Quebec power failure. It knocked out the Hydro-Quebec power system for about 12 hours. 
one of the interesting things from that, from my perspective, is in addition to the Hydro-Quebec power failure, is the fact that the North American power grid is a highly integrated system. And there were impacts and um, features of that power grid failure seen as all the far away as California. The, the cascade through the network propagated that far into the system itself. In, the, in North America and in the, in the US, there are two agencies that have responsibility for that. They're NERC and FERC, the National Energy Reliability Council and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And FERC is right now working on setting up um, uh, uh, directives for the power grid operators to monitor, to attempt to install systems, to mitigate the risk for power grid failure in, in resulting from a geomagnetic disturbance, a GMD is the, is the terminology that gets thrown around for that. There are actually documented cases of people actually being able to use telegraph systems during major geomagnetic storms off the currents that are flowing in the, in the ionosphere. And then, I don't know that this is entirely true, but my friends over in the Space Weather Prediction T Center tell me that the earliest known space weather hazard was a fire started in a telegraph station because the currents were induced in it and a little paper thing was left in the paper tape of the, of the telegraph machine and the current caught it on fire and, and, and burned down a little portion of the, of the telegraph station. So, so we talk about the modern consequences of space weather, but we actually can go back and find even more interesting events for, for space weather going back in the day. Let's see if I can get this to go on here. Yes, okay. So anyway, did you have a question? So the big burst of stuff, that, the great question. So that's the, that's the coronal mass ejection. So what actually it is, is, is pla a big ball of hot plasma. Uh, so a gas that's so hot that the electrons and, the, uh, and the, the, the ions have gotten separated in it, coming out from the surface of the sun. It's usually five to 10 times more dense than the ambient solar wind. It depends a little bit. And it is traveling um, uh, about three, four times faster than the ambient solar wind. So it's a big shock, a big blob of hot plasma that's coming out from the sun. Expand, it does, it's definitely expanding it as it goes out into the, into the heliosphere. And usually inside that blob of plasma is a stronger, more intense magnetic field. And we're going to come back to that point in just a minute. So actually, Dun, 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 to your point, what's in that blob? What, what are we looking at here? So this is, this, is, this is returning back to that event in September of, of last year. This is a, um, a, a view of the, uh, the corona, it's called coronagraph. So we're using a disk to block out the sun. This little white circle in here is actually the, the, uh, the size of the sun. This disk is you know, creating an artificial um, uh, eclipse, if you will, to block out the main light of the sun, letting us see the material that's coming from the from the CME out into the into the system itself, we call it a halo CME because it kind of encompasses the whole the whole sun. There you go. There's this big blast coming right directly towards you, the big blob of material coming at you. When the folks, the forecasters over in the Space Weather Prediction Center, see this this type of an event in the in the coronagraphs, they gear up their 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 models and and they um, uh, take their best guess as to where on the sun it occurred, what direction it was coming at, and how broad it was. Actually, that best guess is informed by the, uh, the Lasco uh, spacecraft and then potentially by other spacecraft that are in orbits behind and closer to the sun and further from the sun, so ahead and behind the Earth, the so-called stereo spacecraft, to get a view of what's going on on that. Then they feed that into a, um, a magnetohydrodynamic model of, of the, the near Earth or the, the, the heliosphere and to sort of say, okay, what's going to happen with this material coming out? And you can see these big blobs that you're seeing here and, and here in these, in, these, in these views are the CMEs arriving at the little green dot that is the Earth. And, and we're making a prediction of what the, the solar wind density is going to be, what the solar wind velocities are going to be at, at the Earth and then at these uh, stereo spacecraft that are ahead and behind of the, of the system itself. And so they got this um, uh, prediction of actually there were two, two major coronal mass ejections that happened. You can kind of see the second one running into the first one right there in the system itself. And they were going to predict a major geomagnetic storm arriving on um, uh, the, the 12th and the 13th. Now, being space weather people, we don't have nearly as much money or nearly as much data as you terrestrial weather guys folks do. So, so we take the Earth and boil it down to one number. 
Um, uh, we call that number Kp, and that tells us how much activity, magnetic activity, is going on in a particular three-hour window on, on the Earth. And so this is a plot of what Kp was for September 11th, 12th, and the 13th. Uh, the, the September 12th, you can see that there was this little red blob here that happened at the very beginning of this thing that lasted for about um, uh, uh, six hours. And then on the, on the end of the 12th, going into the 13th, there was a, another short period of time where there was a, a bit of activity. On this nine-point scale, this is actually a nine-point um, quasi-logarithmic scale. It, don't get me started on how Kp is calculated. Anyway, the, on this nine-point scale, you can see that it got up to about six, maybe six and a half here in the, in the end of this, this period, like particular time for only a three-hour period of time. A really big storm gets up to nine and stays there for a long period of time. So this is not a big deal in terms of, 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 of storming and activity. And so the real question is, why did that, um, uh, you know, predictions that made it into the media that big geomagnetic storm was going to happen, everybody should freak out, not come into play. Well, it turns out that this model that I showed you with the arrival time forecast coming from the Space Weather Prediction Center actually did a pretty good job. So these cyan lines that you see on this plot are the predicted arrival times of the coronal mass, of the first coronal mass ejection and the second coronal mass ejection. Um, uh, at uh, the, uh, the ACE satellite, which is just upstream of the Earth, about 45 minutes solo wind propagation time into play. And so this is the arrival time, and the, the actual shock in CME is arriving here at this period of time for this first storm, and, and I, you know, I actually almost nailed it exactly for, for the, the, the second time. The advertised accuracy of these arrival time forecasts is plus or minus six hours, so they're well within their plus or minus six hour forecast accuracy for the system itself. The solar wind speeds jumped up a little bit for the first one, jumped up pretty high for the second one. The nominal typical speed is down here at around 300, 400 kilometers per second. You can see that there's a shock going on here, jump up in density associated with that. The real question, the real story of why there wasn't much activity going on in these things is actually down here in this bottom panel. And this bottom panel is telling you what the directionality of the magnetic field is inside that CME blob that's coming out from the sun. And one thing you could see here early on, in this, especially in this first one, is that there really isn't much in the way of strength. And it's pretty variable. There's a little bit of an interval here where the interplanetary magnetic field is, is, is the z component of it is negative. We actually also commonly refer to that as southward interplanetary magnetic field. Why southward? Because it's opposite to the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. If you think about a dipole with a, you know, a magnet coming in there, there's going to be magnetic field lines coming out of the South Pole, coming in, coming back into the Earth in the, in the North Pole. And the southward magnetic field is going to be oppositely aligned to the Earth's magnetic field. When that oppositely aligned fields collide with each other, a process called magnetic reconnection happens. We're letting energy come into that system. If you'll hearken back to that NASA animation that we were showing, those field lines were breaking and whatnot, and the energy was flowing into the magneto tail and, and creating the aurora in that you know, cartoon view of the system. That only happens, generally speaking, when the IMF is, is southward. This first storm didn't have much kind of a time frame with, with a southward IMF. There's a little bit of northward here at the beginning, and then this short burst of southward interplanetary magnetic fields for this second guy, and a long time frame when there's northward interplanetary magnetic fields. So with strongly northward interplanetary magnetic fields, we're not going to get a lot of energy into the system. We're not going to get a big geomagnetic storm here at the Earth. And so the major challenge, one of the major challenges that we have in space weather forecasting is being able to predict that interplanetary magnetic field. Being able to predict that interplanetary magnetic field is a modeling challenge, it's a physics and observing challenge, it's the, it's the holy grail of what we're going after from the remote sensing and, and scientific investigation area in, in my field. I don't do a lot of observing for that kind of stuff, but one of the things I do work on is modeling. And so what you're actually looking at here is a classic hairy billiard ball picture that hopefully will, once I explain it to you, give you a little bit of a better feel for, for what's going on in the system. So this sphere that you see here in the, in the, in the center is actually a sphere at, at 20 solar radii, so a sphere 20 times the radius of the sun. That's where we place the inner boundary of the, of the helium. Most people place the inner boundary of their heliospheric simulations. 
the primary reason for doing that is we don't have many observations in that area at all. So it's a model interpolation to get out to that boundary, and it lets the solar wind be supersonic. So you don't have to deal with the subsonic to supersonic transition in your modeling domain. It makes it easier to do. Um, and then this disk is the ecliptic plane, right, where the Earth is orbiting around the, around the sun. And what you're seeing in the ecliptic plane is just a coloring of, of the, uh, the solar wind velocities. And then these um, lines that you're seeing coming out here are actually um, uh, magnetic field lines that have been drawn from a region on the, on the surface of the sun or the interior boundary of the, of the simulation domain. And then they're colored with the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field. And the bluer colors are negative, so southward IMF, and the red colors are, are northward IMF. And you can see that this blob has a bit of a twist. So what we're working on right now is actually trying to be able to model these kinds of magnetic structures propagating out into the, um, uh, the, the heliosphere. So here's a idealized, very idealized sun with this sort of a purely radial um, uh, field on it. And then this CME with the leading edge blob comes out here. And you can see this big twist of a magnetic field inside that configuration and the, and the undulations and, and waves and whatnot that are appearing in the, in the magnetic field inside the coronal mass ejection. And if we could get what this field structure was going to be into the forecast model capability, we could say, OK, not only is it going to arrive at this point in time, but it's likely to induce a big geomagnetic storm. Yes, sir? Yep. Just basically. Yeah, basically, the, the forecast model is actually just really simply, a, it, it, it's, it's basically a ballistic propagation. It's a bit more sophisticated than that. But it's just telling you what time the, the density plug, the velocity plug, is going to arrive at. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't give you the key ingredient of the, of the magnetic field in the, in the system itself. Um, there are a lot of challenges in this. There's a modeling challenge to be able to get this modeling right and get this more advanced. There's also a big observing challenge to be able to initialize what that magnetic field configuration is going to be inside that, inside that CME when it arrives. Probably the first step will be to try to do an ensemble of different kinds of configurations coming into play and bound how big or how severe we think it might come into play from the system from, from there. OK, so now I'm going to start talking about geospace. And there's a bit of terminology, a bit of, a bit of uh, background stuff that I want to kind of cover to lay the groundwork for that as we get closer to the Earth. Uh, there's a great uh, um, comet module uh, available if you want to do a little bit more detail, a little bit more of the background physics behind this. It's, um, uh, if you just go to comet and you search Aurora, it'll, it'll come up with the, uh, the system there. This is a little animation from the Aurora that's actually explaining that magnetic reconnection process that I was talking about earlier on. Right? We've got this southward interplanetary magnetic field line coming in doing magnetic reconnection here, getting draped on into the magnetotail, another magnetic reconnection process happening, and the flux gets convected around. This outer boundary that you see here is actually what we call the bow shock. It is sort of one of the boundaries that defines where the magnetosphere begins, if you will. And that's because the flow of the solar wind is, as I said, supersonic. And so just like a bullet or a plane, you're going to have a shock wave in front of this, this object as it's going past it. This red dashed line that you see here is what we call the magnetopause. And that's essentially the boundary where the Earth's magnetic field is dominant inside of this, and the solar wind is more dominant in this, in this kind of outside kind of a time scale here. What you're seeing here in this convection kind of a time scale here is happening on the order of an hour to a couple of hours kind of a time scale. And this, this uh, energy input, a bit of storage, and then reconnection and release process is actually something that we call a substorm. Happens quite quite frequently in, in, the, uh, in the Earth system. It's going on pretty much all the time. Anytime the IMF is turning southward, there are these, these small bursts of, of releases of, of energy that are happening in them. Substorms can be part of a larger geomagnetic storm activity that usually lasts over several days in, in length. They were originally thought that you took a bunch of substorms to build together to create a storm, but now we now know that they can happen in an independent kind of a, kind of a fashion. And then in the, in the region around the Earth, there we also have um, a high energy particle population or relativistic energy particle population, MeV electrons, MeV proton kind of a thing, that we call the radiation belts or the Van Allen belts. You may have heard them referred to in, in that way. Uh, a funny story on that, there was a NASA mission that's actually operating now that when it was on development and, and being launched was called the Radiation Belt Storm Probe, RBSP. 
Um, uh, once they launched it and proved that it was successfully working, they renamed it to the Van Allen probes. Um, uh, but I believe it's still abbreviated RVSP because of, I don't know, weirdness. I wanted to also just touch base on uh, a little bit of the current systems that are going to come in play in discussion of the, of the magnetosphere itself. You can, you can think about um, uh, going back to your introductory electrodynamic physics class that you took when you were a college undergraduate. I had a quantum teacher that always used to say, oh, you did that in kindergarten when I was a grad student. I'm like, you went to a different kindergarten than I did. Um, but anyway, going back to your introductory physics class in the, in the system itself, you remember the solenoidal magnetic field thing, right? We got a, we got a current that's flowing around here, and we do our right-hand rule kind of a thing, and we get this magnetic field that's going to be, you know, threading in here, coming in down this way on the tail, and the opposite directed set of currents here gives you the opposite sense of the field coming out here, so you get a northern and southern hemisphere kind of a configuration. We call this the, the cross-tail current of the system itself. The interaction of the solar wind um, uh, magnetic field with the Earth's magnetic field creates a variety of different current systems, a, a chapman ferraro current that's flowing on the magnetopause, currents that are flowing um, uh, from the magnetopause down into the ionosphere, and then a, a ring current that's flowing around the Earth in the near Earth space environment. All are creating a, a distortion in the shape of the, you know, dipole magnetic field of the Earth as it's sort of squished on the day side by the flow flowing into it and stretched out on the, on the night side. And these are the current systems that represent that kind of a change in the configuration of the, of the system itself. I guess I was supposed to hit a bunch of arrows here. Oh, well. Okay. Coming down to the Earth, we get to have another view of the of the currents coming into the into the system itself. This is another picture from that comet module. These are those field line currents that are flowing down along field lines from the magnetosphere into the upper levels of the ionosphere, and then closing in the ionosphere um, uh, through um, Pedersen and Hall currents that are a result of the uh, ionized particles being dragged around by the magnetic field and also colliding with the neutral particles from the from the thermosphere and atmosphere that are that are present there in the in the system itself. There's a pretty significant flaw f with this um, uh, diagram from the from the comet module. You see most of the current closing over the top of the polar cap in this configuration. Actually, most of the current closes between these so-called region one and region two currents. So the region one current at higher latitude and the region two current at at lower latitude. And there are a variety of different current systems and convection that's going on in the in the um, in the ionosphere, you'll probably hear me talk a little bit later on about uh, cross-polar cap convection or convection patterns. These currents are driving electric fields. The electric fields are going to be driving the, the motions of the ions, and they move in this sort of two-cell pattern. We call it convection because it looks a lot like the convection that you see when you're boiling water or any kind of you know heating phenomenon process that are coming into play. So that that terminology gets gets thrown around here. Okay, so how do we go about modeling the, the, the geospace environment? Well, much like the, uh, the folks in the, the community Earth system model together, there was initial work on developing a weather model for the, for the Earth and an ocean model and an ice model. Well, we had all our different little regions, and we've begun to build together a, a coupled model of, of geospace. And the coupled model of geospace has a magnetospheric model that we call the, the MFLFM, the Multi-Fluid Lion Fetter Mowbray Code. Um, uh, that's modeling the nearer space environment that you can see kind of coming into here. We have uh, a coupler that, that's handling the exchange of uh, electrodynamic in, in particle information between the magnetosphere and the upper levels of the, or in the, in the upper levels of the atmosphere, the thermosphere, or ionosphere model, the, the TIE GCM uh, in this configuration. And actually, it turns out that the uh, the physics of the inner magnetosphere is not actually well represented by the, the the MHD physics that we use to model the whole magnetosphere. So we stick in a, an inner magnetospheric model, in this case, the, the Rice convection model, to help get, get us get better physics of of the inner magnetosphere. Uh, I spent about. 10, maybe 15 years of my life making this diagram actually happen. So it looks really pretty, but there's a lot of code and all sorts of other stuff that, that happens in, when you're trying to couple these kinds of models together. The, um, 
The multi-fluid version of the, uh, of the LFM is uh, solving what are known as the magnetohydrodynamic equations. So you think about the Euler equations that you guys are all probably familiar with from the, from the terrestrial weather world kind of a thing. And you add electrodynamics on top of that, and you get magnetohydrodynamics. And that's what's going on in that, in that system. So we're solving those equations in a computational domain that goes about 30 times the radius of the Earth upstream, about 300 times the radius of the Earth downstream and about 100 plus or minus in Y. And then we carve out a little sphere here in the center. It's about 2 RE in geocentric districts, 1 RE in altitude. Actually, I guess I should fix that label in there. Um, and it's solving the things you solve for in oil equation kind of a world. Uh, how, how much stuff is there? How fast is it going? How hot is it? And the magnetic field. What's the magnetic field configuration coming into play? It needs to know what the solar wind is. It needs a way of turning MHD parameters into particle fluxes. And it needs to know what the inner boundary is going to be um, coming out from the, from the model. It needs to know that from an electrodynamic sense and a plasma outflow sense. The electrodynamic information is obtained from the, the mixed coupler. The mixed coupler is actually solving for that convection pattern in the high latitude region. Um, right now, we're just doing a sort of a 2D slab uh, ionosphere, usually at 120 kilometers altitude. And this big, complicated beast of an equation is actually just current continuity. It's the divergence of the perpendicular current is equal to the parallel current. And it's just basically saying what comes in has to go out by closing in some way that's dependent on what the conductivities are in the, in the Earth's ionosphere. And there are two main contributions to the uh, conductances in the, in the ionosphere. Um, the EUV, how much what the ultraviolet light of the sun is doing to ionize the upper levels of the atmosphere, and the energetic particle fluxes, the aurora that are coming down into the ionosphere and creating new particles there and changing the conductivity. So with that information, we can solve that electrodynamic calculation and turn that electrodynamic calculation back into a velocity and use that as the boundary condition for the inner portion of the magnetospheric model. Um, what we can then do with the electrodynamic coupling is feed that into the TIE GCM to give us a specification of what the uh, thermosphere ionosphere system is going to, to look at over um, the entire globe from roughly 97 kilometers to 500 kilometers in, in altitude. I say roughly because it's actually being calculated on pressure level grids, so those, those altitudes change. It's essentially solving for the O plus and, and, and a few other ion species and figuring out where they're moving and using chemical equilibrium to go back and forth from that. It needs auroral particle fluxes and high latitude drifts, which you can get from the, the uh, MFLFM kind of a configuration. And then we use some kind of empirical specification for what the tidal forcing is at the, at the lower boundary. So we got this big, complicated beast of a model. We um, uh, want to know whether or not this big, complicated beast of a model is, is doing anything close to reality. So we get into the verification, validation kind of a phase of, of, the, of the model development process. So to do that, one of the things we looked at was the so-called whole heliosphere interval. Um, uh, it was part of the uh, International Heliophysical Year done in 2008, which was like the 100th anniversary, no, the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year, which was 1958. Um, uh, so trying to bring coordinated observations together uh, to, to look at the, the, the system and, and go after and building up a, a variety of observations and a variety of modeling capabilities. We did a run for a particular rotation of the sun. Um, Solar physicists, like most people, like to have things named after famous people in their field. And so uh, Richard Carrington did a lot of several observations of the sun, and including what the distribution of the sunspots look like on the sun. And so a rotation of the sun is, is called a Carrington rotation. And they, I don't know what, Carrington, what date Carrington rotation number one is, but Carrington rotation number 2068 happened from March 20th to April 16th of, of uh, 2008. You can get into an era where the Carrington rotation number matches up with the years, kind of typically, and you, you can get confused. So anyway, but, but essentially, Carrington rotation, a month of the sun. This particular month of the sun happened in the last solar minimum around 2008. And so there weren't that many CMEs going on in this kind of a time frame. But there was actually a repeating pattern of high speed streams and, and co-rotating interaction regions, CIRs, that were going on in here. And you can see these you know, um, uh, 
there's slow wind and fast wind, so the fast wind is catching up with the slow wind, it's compressing it, and interacting in that region. You can kind of see this little interaction region here. And then there's these intervals of sustained high speed, you know, six, seven hundred kilometers per second. Those are wind speeds that were seen in the in the CMEs. But unlike the CMEs, we don't have much in the way of um, uh, uh, high strength in the magnetic field, and it's pretty variable bouncing around going on. So we're not going to get a huge amount of geomagnetic activity in these kind of intervals as you would in the uh, in the CMEs. The nice thing from the modeling perspective is I'm not hitting, only hitting it too hard, and I've got 28 days of, of actual model stuff that I can go back and compare with observations to see how well the model is doing from that perspective. So when I do that, um, I get the results of this. One of the things that one of the questions that I've sort of been interested in looking at is what are the effects of model resolution on the accuracy of the, of the model forecasts that, that we put out. The model can run at a bunch of different modes for historical reasons. We call these single, double, and quad. You can essentially see that we're doubling factors of the resolution in the, in the system when we're going up from these things here. The results of the different model cut planes through the, through the uh, north-south pole are shown here with the single, double, and, and, and quad. We, we ran this over the full 27-day thing with a two-minute dump interval, you know, giving you 20K files and, and you know, roughly two and a half terabytes and 385,000 core hours to, to complete. So not an inconsequential amount of time, but certainly not CMIP5 kind of, kind of volumes. But, but big enough for me to say, hey, it qualifies as big data, especially when I start to think about the fact that I have 206 different individual magnetometer stations that I could go and try to, try to make some comparisons and accuracy um, uh, calculations from. So hopefully you'll, you'll grant me that that's big data. So when we actually do the, uh, the, uh, these uh, calculations, we can start to look at the, what the, um, uh, the, the ground magnetic field response is going to be from the currents that are flowing in the, in the uh, uh, upper levels of the ionosphere. Back to that, that diagram that I was showing you before. What, you're, what we're seeing here is the, the, the current pattern in the top and the predicted magnetic field perturbations that are a result of those current patterns at the single, double, and quad resolution. The, this point in time here, you can see there's a little bit of a structure starting to show up in the, in the quad resolution of the field aligned current pattern, and then the current's closing with it, and then the, the, the changes that are visible there. This is around the time, which show this, 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 this animation should evolve here, and it's around the time of the, uh, the first CME, excuse me, CIR and, and high speed stream. So we get to build up these current structures that are coming into play and, 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 and perturbations that are seen in the ground magnetic field much finer structure in the quad resolution, not a whole heck of a lot of activity going on in the, in the single resolution. And the double, not surprisingly, is a bit in between for, for the calculations that are, that are coming into play. So, okay, pretty pictures. Do the pretty pictures have any semblance to reality? This is some initial work that we're just getting started with. And that is um, uh, to start making some com calculations, some comparisons to um, uh, a measure of, of activity. It's called the AL index. It's a, you know, taking a bunch of different magnetometer stations and um, uh, taking the envelope of them to, to do the calculation. The actual observed AL is shown here with the, uh, the green line. And then the other lines show you the, the, the results from the various different um, uh, resolutions of the, of the model. The, the nuts and the bolts of the information is actually down here in the, in the error metric calculation, right? So everybody's favorite simple error metric is, is, a, is an RMS kind of an error, a cross correlation and a prediction and efficiency kind of a thing. And what you can, what I see here is that it's not a great calculation at any level of the resolution, but it's pretty bad at the um, uh, single. It gets dramatically better when you dump up to uh, double and, and refined, but not this is not a comparable jump when you get up to the uh, to the to the quad resolution. So from a operationalized perspective, there's probably a lot of value here in the in the double resolution mode of the calculation. It's certainly a lot less core hours than the than the quad resolution portion of the calculation. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done in that space. I mentioned the electrodynamic coupling with the mix solver, and that's pretty much where the state of the art is at the moment. 
we're moving into a more uh, complete understanding of the system in that there's a sort of a gap between the magnetospheric calculation and the ionospheric calculation of about an RE or so in, in distance that hasn't traditionally been included in the models. And there is plasma that can flow out of the upper levels of the ionosphere into the magnetosphere and can affect the, the dynamics of, of the system. In order to be able to do that kind of modeling, we need to understand where and how much material is going to come out of the ionosphere into the magnetosphere. With the uh, LFM, we did some initial testing work where we said, okay, let's just sort of get some um, uh, statistics and, and understanding of the system. And we know that a lot of material flows out of the so-called cusp region of the ionosphere out into the magnetosphere. That's a reflection of this point down into the system. So let's just turn on some outflow there and see how that impacts the evolution of the system. So we're going to show that in this comparison movie over here. This panel on the left is a run of the single fluid version of the code. So you can see the traditional magnetospheric features, so the bow shock, the magnetopause, and then there's a bunch of field lines that have been drawn from fixed points along here on the, uh, along the x-axis that are showing this stretched tail-like configuration. At 02 simulation time, the interplanetary magnetic field is going to be southward, and I'm going to turn on some outflow. And that's going to show, you're going to see that in this multi-fluid simulation over here, where at the beginning there's no oxygen outflow, and then you'll see this outflow coming on here. And we're going to look at the dynamics, the evolution of these magnetic field lines in the magneto tail to see how the dynamics of the system changes. So we get this substorm, a big blob of plasma was just ejected down the tail. Same thing happened in the initial simulation. But with this outflow, you can see that we get this second blob of plasma that happens in the system. Whereas the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, this configuration remains steady. There's the blob, no blob over here. With the uh, inclusion of the outflow, we interrupt the ability of the magnetosphere to get into a quasi-stable equilibrium, changing the magnetic reconnection properties in the tail. And so it's dramatically changing the evolution of, of the system. This is a first indication that we had that the, including this kind of thing is really fundamental to understanding the dynamics and evolution of the, of the whole coupled system. So to be able to do a bit better than that, what we wanted to do was go move away from my simplistic model of just turning on some outflow in a particular region of the ionosphere and go to use some uh, data and observations to, to drive when and where the outflow was going to happen. So we looked at the electric and magnetic fields and saw that there was you know, pointing flux energy coming into the upper levels of the ionosphere in these particular bands. And in fact, there's some observational work by uh, Bob Strangeway using a different satellite that said, hey, where this stuff happens, there's a relationship that tells you how much outflow material you're going to get depending on how much electromagnetic energy you dumped into the upper levels of the ionosphere. And then we could turn that into uh, a specification of how much material is going to flow out into the magnetosphere at a variety of different velocities and, and, and temperatures. And what impact does that have on the system itself? And so this is actually a, uh, a slide that's showing you a bit of a, a, a summary of a bunch of different runs. The baseline run here is shown with this gray line. And we don't actually see much activity going on. There's a little bit of a blip here. And this is the magnetic field in the near Earth region. And then perhaps the one that ca catches your eye most clearly is this blue line. And it kind of goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. We call that a sawtooth oscillation. It's actually first observed in tokamak plasma reactions. And it looks like teeth on a saw to some extent. So being highly clever people, they named it the sawtooth oscillation. And that's present when we have the outflow in the system and, and not present when we have the outflow in the system. And if we change the driving, we can change the period of, of the system. And if we change the amount of uh, material that's flowing out from the ionosphere, we can change the, uh, the periodicity of, of these uh, sawtooth oscillations. So a link between the sawtooth oscillations and the outflow is a prediction of this model. Uh, and a uh, graduate student working with me and Bill Lotko at, at Dartmouth College did these runs and actually managed to get it published in science. Magnetosphere usually doesn't make it into science very often. And having a grad student on the, as the lead author on the science paper, we thought,
thought was a pretty um, uh, significant achievement as well for that kind of a thing. But real fundamental discovery about, or fundamental prediction about how we, we think it's going to impact the, uh, the evolution of the system. And the data guys are going back and seeing if they can tease out, they haven't really looked at it in this sense, if there's any relationship between outflow intensity and the periodicity of, of the uh, saw teeth intervals that, that are observed. And the last little thing I wanted to show you was um, uh, some, some, re some results of some high resolution simulations looking at the dynamics of flows in the, in the magneto tail. So this, this portion of the magnetosphere over here. This view is um, a view of a cut plane through sort of the center of the Earth. So it's kind of giving you a center view of the, of the system. We can see the, the bow shock here, the, the magneto pause here. The coloring that I'm using here is uh, taking the, um, the dipole magnetic field and subtracting it off of it everywhere else so I can see the perturbations that are a result of the interactions that are going on. You can clearly see the, the compression of the field on the, on the day side with this stronger green color coming into play. And we'll see some things that are returning it to more dipolar configuration than the purple configuration that will come into play here. This vector field that's a little bit hard to see at this point in time is giving you the directionality and the strength of the flows in the magneto tail. The color of the arrow corresponds to the flow intensity as well as the, the length that you're seeing into play here. And then these little blue lines here are going to be representative of locations where magnetic reconnection may occur in the system. So I will turn the movie on. IMF is just turning southward. We're going to see some beautiful little Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities developing along the flanks of the, of the magnetopause. We're going to be slowly dumping energy into the system. And right around 5 o'clock, we're going to see some bursts of flow coming down into the uh, inner magnetosphere from this magnetic reconnection line that's highly variable in time and space as it's going on into the system here and we're going to get down towards the end we're in sort of this quasi stable equilibrium configuration with lots of little individual flow channels coming off of the, uh, the system itself. So what do these flow channels look like? We're going to zoom in on one and I need to pick up the pace or skip something. Okay. So we get this individual little flow channel coming into play here and then you can see that there's this second burst of flow activity coming out of the, the configuration in the, in the movie. One of the things that we wanted to be able to do is to say, okay, what does this look like? There have been some observations that have been made of these dipolarization fronts or burst bulk flows made with spacecraft in the, in the near Earth tail. It's hard for us to get a simulation to agree exactly with the observations because to some extent some of these things may actually be turbulent and getting you know the right spot in a turbulent kind of a calculation isn't going to be easy. So we're going to do kind of two levels of comparison. One, we're going to do a, a case study to look and see what's going on in the, in the configuration. And what we've got here is you can see this, this high speed flow in the, in the red line pushing some uh, compression of the field and density ahead of it as it propagates from the distant tail down into the near Earth region. When I first looked at this plot, I just actually drew by eye this line coming all the way through here in that configuration. But it turns out that actually what's going on here is that there's this second blob of activity. And if we come back to a snapshot in time, what we can see here is that shortly before that time here, there's this flow that's gone through here and this dipolarization front coming into play here. And then magnetic reconnection has happened along this blue line and set out another burst of flow that's going to come in here a little bit and hit the purple and orange distances in there and also come propagating down the tail. And if we come back and look at my little um, uh, display here, um, uh, the, the, it just misses the purple one here, but it's showing up clearly at the orange and into the, into the yellow spot here and with this, with this enhanced flow, the compression of the field and compression of the density followed by a reduction of the, of the density. And so this is a strong indication to me in the simulation that these BBFs and dipolarization fronts are triggered by the magnetic reconnection in the simulation. I actually went back and took a zoomed out view and I can actually find the magnetic reconnection figure point in the distant tail that was the origin of this burst of flow coming into the inner magnetosphere. Okay, so that looks all kind of cool and pretty, but does it have any semblance to what's actually observed in the real world system? 
Well, to go after the real world comparisons, what we decided to do was to do a statistical comparison. So stuck a bunch of points in the, in the magneto tail on a, on a uniform grid and used criteria uh, similar, actually exactly the same as was used in an observing study in the, in the, in the field to look at high speed flows and look for intervals when the high speed flow happened. And that essentially gives me an algorithm that goes around and lets me look for flows that get higher than some particular value and pick off a unique starting time, namely the time at which the flow is below 100 kilometers per second after it had exceeded this thing. It, it uh, doesn't allow for double counting here in the sense because this one never gets below the back below the threshold indicator in the in the system there. But I'm able to pick off a whole bunch of individual points there. So when I do that for my data set, I get a, several hundred. Um, uh, different comparison points that I want to be able to, to look at. And I can make a statistical comparison with the observations to, to what was seen. Um, and this comparison is actually showing you the results of uh, superposed epoch analysis, you essentially using that red dot as the zero time for all the data, add it together, average it, and you can get a statistical view of what's going on. This was done in a satellite set of observations. You can see this bump up in the, in the flow velocity, uh, compression of the field, and a reduction in the, in the, in the density after the, after the flow passes back through the configuration. Uh, and then the results from the LFM study at a plane um, uh, slightly above the, uh, the equatorial plane. The profile width of the uh, LFM BBFs is a bit broader than, than was seen in there. Um, the magnetic field agreement is actually quite good. You can see here we've got a, a disparity of the magnetic field in the z, in the x direction and the z direction that's that's larger um, uh, before the BBF passes through and smaller afterwards. The, there's a similar reduction, actually, and probably even a larger magnitude reduction in the observations. That's actually what we call a dipolarization, returning the field to a more dipolar structure. Really nice thing to be able to see in the in the configuration. And then the biggest notable difference here in terms of scales that we're looking at is this density drop. We see a density drop with the roughly the right time profile showing up here, but in the simulation, the scale has changed, and so it's significantly larger in, in magnitude. I didn't go into it, but there's a whole lot of uh, idealized stuff that I've gone into here. So essentially what I think has happened is I managed to create a really dense plasma sheet so I can make bigger holes in it than I could in the typical plasma sheet configuration. So where are we going? Where, what's, the, what's the boundary of what we want to be able to do with um, uh, uh, the modeling? We want to be able to get to sort of the next generation of that figure that I showed you earlier on, where we're um, uh, you know, sticking in with our um, uh, core elements here. We've got a, an electrodynamic solver that's actually covering the whole globe, not just the high latitude portion of it. And an ionosphere plasmosphere model that actually includes outflow that lets us have material flowing back and forth between the ionosphere and the, and the, and the magnetosphere. Gives you a full electrodynamic and mass coupling um, uh, with no gaps in the coverage and has the potential to, to provide new uh, space weather predictions for, for the system itself. And then probably the bleeding edge of where we're going to go to is to throw the MHD stuff out the window and go to a hybrid calculation where instead of using uh, um, uh, a fluid approach, we're using a kinetic approach to model the, the dynamics of the system. These are some, some beautiful simulations from my colleague Jan Parl, who did a hybrid calculation for Mercury's magnetosphere, and you can see all the different dynamics and evolutions that are, that are going on in that. It's a lot easier to do this for Mercury than it is for Earth, because Mercury's a lot smaller, um, uh, and you need less particles, and you can go after it. But with the computing uh, things that are on the, on the horizon, it, it, it probably is going to become practical to, to go this way, and it's at least a, an initial area that's worth giving a try on. So I hope I have been able to uh, give you an overview of what space weather is, uh, that it both has practical applications and some interesting science questions that we're able to address. And we can go after using numerical models, a bunch of different things in the geospace environment. We have some skill at predicting the currents that drive the geomagnetically induced currents that can lead to the major disruptions for, for, for power grids. We can go after the characteristics of these high-speed flows that are happening in the magneto tail. I didn't go into it, but they're important for the energization of particles and the radiation belts that pose a risk to the uh, spacecraft observations. And there are a whole bunch of challenges coming up with being able to do predictions for space weather modeling, not the least of which is the prediction of uh, the interplanetary magnetic field in the, uh, 
the region between the sun and the earth. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. So the, the biggest part that has to be improved is the is the mass coupling. The, the getting getting the models and the understanding of the of the mass coupling is we we're just starting in that area and we don't have a very good physical model for it. Everything I was showing you was just so all empirical and so being able to build a good physical model and physical understanding of that coupling in my mind is one of the real key challenge areas. Yeah. And and uh, say say you had a perfect model. Uh -huh. uh, how 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 big of a problem is the initial condition error? So it's not quite as bad as an initial condition problem as it is, say, in terrestrial weather forecasting because it's so highly forced by the changes in the solar wind that are happening on the upstream boundary condition that the persistent time is only a few hours. So that it, it, it's not as nearly as bad as an initial condition problem as it is in, in, in that system, say. Art doesn't believe me. So uh, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, I ran a little bit long. Uh, I am more than happy, and actually I think it's part of the plan, to uh, answer additional questions over lunch. What, what I would recommend is that it's a beautiful day, so grab some lunch over here in the cafeteria, and then we'll go outside and sit under the, the wonderful UCAR blue awning and um, uh, have, some, have some lunch and continue the conversation in, in that environment, if that, that works for you. Okay.